Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Importance and Effect of Surgical Training, Skills, and Experience on Performing Surgical Procedures Within Studies. I am Brenda Kelly Kim of Lab Roots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Importance and Effect of Surgical Training, Skills, and Experience on Performing Surgical Procedures Within Studies. I am Brenda Kelly Kim of Lab Roots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Delphine Bouillard. She received her doctorate in veterinary medicine from the Veterinary School of Lyon. She is currently working as a surgery consultant for Vetsalis. She has experience working with animal suppliers, pharma companies, diverse CROs, medical device suppliers, biotechs, as well as universities and vet schools. I will now turn it over to Dr. Bouillard for her presentation. Thank you very much, Brenda, for this introduction, and I would like also to thank the Laboratory Animal Science Board for their invitation. I'm actually very happy to have the opportunity to talk about training in surgery. I'm working uh, for more than 12 years now in the Laboratory Animal Science uh, area with a focus on surgery, and I had the opportunity to develop new models with several teams. And the least I can say is that training, when it comes to developing new models in surgery, is really a key to success. And by success, I mean respecting animal welfare, being compliant with the three Earth principles, and really performing good science. When starting to work on a challenging surgical model, you might think that uh, animal survival is the goal. Uh, well, in my opinion, it's definitely not, because um, performing good science actually means making every effort to control or eliminate non-experimental variables. When it comes to surgery, eliminating variables means producing highly homogeneous batches of operated animals. So being in the green area on the slide, and when you start working with the model and you just get good survival rate or good success rate, and by success I mean, for example, getting good patency rates with vascular catheters, you're usually quite, still quite far away from highly homogeneous batches. You still have to go through quite a lot of training. Uh, and actually, it's quite easy to underestimate um, the, the need for training with several surgical models. First of all, uh, you may lost information along the line. Uh, usually, initially, the surgical models are developed with, for, by people with a good experience, by experts, but then definitely information can get lost uh, when people are trying to teach each other a technique they learned from the initial expert. Then you can also take over mistakes of your teacher. Um, if your teacher is not working according state of the art techniques, it happens sometimes. And the bad thing is that once you have bad habits, it's very difficult to get rid of them. 
For example, if you are tying in proper knots, and believe me, there are many, many people doing that, it's very, very hard to get rid of this bad habit. Who needs to be trained, actually? Um, I won't go into deep details uh, describing what is on this table. It's just generality regarding uh, uh, staff working in this area and, uh, and uh, developing new surgical models. And please don't be mad at me if you are a technician with very high skills. I know that there are many of you. Again, it's just generality. The key message behind this slide is that everybody needs to train. Even if you have a very good surgical background, when you have to learn a completely new uh, surgical model, you have to train. And I will give you a very personal example. Uh, I worked actually for Charles River as surgery uh, unit manager for several years. I was hired there in 2007, and before that, I was performing surgery on a regular basis, experimental surgery on a regular basis for already five years, um, almost on a daily basis. So I had good basic surgical skills, but I had to learn how to implant catheter in rodents, I, and I have never done that before. So I had to learn how to work under the microscope, how to handle uh, rodent vessels, and it actually uh, took me months and several training sessions to reach the success rate and the speed of the technician working there for years. It was really different from what I have been doing before, and it took me much more time than I would have expected. And it wasn't even highly challenging model. It was challenging model, but not highly challenging ones. Um, in uh, experimental surgery, the actual difficulty and associated requested training is actually highly variable. Of course, it is really not the same thing to learn how to put, to put a, an implant subcutaneously and to uh, perform a, a liver transplant. When you're, try, when you're trying to develop and to learn how to perform a highly challenging model, you better go through uh, a lot of training sessions before, and you'll better be performing accessible or challenging models for months or years. There is really absolutely no way to start from scratch with, for example, people not knowing how to tie a surgical knot and directly go to highly challenging models. Uh, believe me, I've been asked several times to train people without surgical background to do, for example, myocardial infarction in mice, there is no way to do that. You have to go step by step, and only people with a very good surgical background can go to highly challenging models. Now let's say that uh, you are a good trainer with the good skills, and you are working according to state-of-the-art technique, and you have people to train, and they also have the right skills to train the, the model you have to teach them. Uh, how would you build your training program? Uh, here are my suggestions for that. I would always start with a theoretical training. Um, I think it's very important for people to be trained to understand the context of the experiment. What is the goal of the surgery? In most cases, surgery is actually a way to precondition the animal for the experiment. And they really, I think it's very important for people to understand why they are doing the surgery, and what is the general context, what is the final goal of the project. They should also have a good knowledge of the anatomy of the organs they will work with. And they should also understand the physiological changes that will be, um, um, that will be the consequences of the surgery. In my experience, people who have this knowledge about the context, about the anatomy, about the physiology, they learn much faster and they get much better success rate. Once you go through this, theoretical training step, then you can go on with the hands-on training. And this hands-on could uh, actually be ex vivo or in vivo. And I will elaborate a little bit more on that uh, with the following slides. But the important thing is that during these hands-on uh, training steps, people will have to repeat in a certain amount of time some key gestures. Uh, like, uh, for example, for uh, a myocardial infar infarction model, how to ligate uh, a coronary artery. The number of key gestures, uh, repetition, can be pretty predefined when you build your training program. 
but it should remain very flexible because you will experience that people are not training, uh, are not learning the, the, the same way, and it's very good to actually adapt your program to the actual surgeon's progresses. At the end of your training steps, uh, so theoretical training and then ends on one, uh, you can eventually go through a validation exam. Uh, I think it's it's quite interesting. This is something we worked on uh, with Charles River Surgery Team. The idea was the following. Uh, people were allowed to train on a certain number of cadavers, inert models, or animals after their theoretical training. And once they were ready, once they really think that uh, they know how to perform the surgery, they were allowed to pass an exam. During the exam, they had to operate a cer certain number of animals, like two or three, for example. The trainer was on their back watching the wall surgery. If everything was okay during the surgery, then the animals were allowed to recover, and then they were followed up during an appropriate follow-up period, during which few success criteria were uh, followed up as well. And at the end of the procedure, the animal of the follow-up time period, sorry, the animals uh, will be sanitized and a necropsy will be, will be performed. If everything was okay uh, during the surgery, during the post-operative observations, and if nothing wrong was seen during the necropsies, then the surgeons were considered as validated. And they could then prepare uh, animals for uh, customer batches. Uh, it sounds a little bit complicated, but it's actually not that much. It's it's quite fun, and it was extremely efficient uh, to validate these training programs. Back to uh, the two steps of the hands-on training, ex vivo or in vivo. Uh, I think it's uh, people tend to skip the ex vivo phase, and it's a shame because there are many, many key gestures of surgery that could be trained with inert models, such as the MDPVC rats you can see on the picture, or surgery pads, for example. Um, sutures, definitely, but also anasto really highly, uh, highly uh, difficult sutures, such as anastomosis, can be trained in this kind of, uh, with this kind of system, and especially the MDPVC rat. Working under a microscope can be trained with this kind of device as well. So it's really very interesting, and you can really um, uh, reduce the number of animals needed for a training by using this kind of systems. Uh, of course, there are situations when you really have to train on living animals. Uh, for example, if you have to implant a telemetry device in the infrarenal abdominal aorta, you need to check at the end of your implantation that uh, there's no bleeding, that there's no leakage, that the signal that you are recording is okay. And when you do blood vessel anastomosis, you need to check at the end of the procedure that there's no blood leakage. So there are, there are definitely models for which you need to go through in vivo phases. You have no choice. And let's work uh, on one specific example. Uh, this uh, example is um, actually a kidney transplant example, learning phase examples. It was published uh, in the late 90s, and uh, so the goal was to try to reach an acceptable ischemia time. Acceptable, uh, by acceptable I mean uh, an ischemia time that allowed the animal to properly recover and, and the kidney to be uh, um, functional. So here, and you cannot see that on, on the shame, first of all, the um, the student, who was actually a, a medical doctor with already um, some surgical experience, trained on 95 rats, um, really to understand the different steps of the procedure and, uh, and really to understand what he had to do with the animals. Once he went through this initial training, he had uh, another 48 animals in order to understand how to work under the microscopes. And then he was using other animals. Uh, once he was really ready to go, he, he really was able to perform the whole procedure and able to work under the, the microscope. Then he started to record the number of animals uh, he, he was using and the ischemia time. And these are the red dots you can see on the shame. Um, as you can see, uh, 95 animals were used initially. Then 
48 others, and then all the numbers, uh, all the figures mentioned on uh, close to the red dots. It's uh, a total of 238 rats. Two key messages uh, behind this slide. This slide, sorry. Uh, first of all, uh, as you can see, when it comes to highly challenging models, the number of key gestures repetition to reach a success rate might be really uh, huge. Uh, other observation, it's, it's really a shame because there are many, many steps, in vivo steps, that should that could have been replaced by ex vivo steps. Um, a lot of the different steps of, of uh, sorry, a lot of these steps could have been trained actually on MDPVC rats, for example. I mean, working under the microscope, you don't need to do that in living animals. And same for um, uh, the initial 95 rats. I'm sure that many, many steps could have been trained on uh, uh, inert models. So uh, don't keep the ex vivo phase. And uh, keep in mind that for highly challenging models, the number of key gesture repetition could be very, very high. So let's, uh, now let's describe two examples of uh, training models, of training programs, sorry. And let's start with the basic model, or at least a model that seems basic. Uh, the subcutaneous implantation of a continuous infusion device in Zucker rats. Uh, there are a few notions to be understood, uh, pre-requested surgical skills, and the number of key gestures repetition is not very high. I mentioned three to six on the slide because the surgery is quite basic. Okay, it looks basic, but again, you have to work with Zucker rats, uh, hazard animals. And these are animals for which you may have to adapt the surgical technique, but also the pre- and post-operative care. Uh, for example, these are animals very sensitive to some anesthetics, and they also quite often have impaired wound healing. So you should adapt the way that you're suturing their skin, and you should also adapt the post-operative follow-up. Uh, so here are, uh, in blue, my suggestions for the training program. A few hours of theory, uh, during which I would insist on aseptic techniques and strain specificities. Then uh, end on technique on cadavers, and on technique on cadaver again and uh, non-survival surgeries. And then eventually the validation exam. So it's a total of 14 hours, two survival surgeries. And true story, I'm comparing that with something that happened. Um, a team actually, um, I think, slightly underestimated the need for training for this model, thinking that it was very easy, and uh, immediately started to prepare a batch for an experiment. Out of 20 animals prepared, 15 had post-operative problems or died during the anesthesia uh, because uh, actually the, the, the program was not fully adapted. Uh, the protocol, sorry, was not fully adapted. So um, as you can imagine, repeating the experiment was really uh, a problem. And when you compare the time and um, the efforts that would have been spent to completely repeat the study, as compared to what I'm suggesting in terms of uh, initial training, I think it's, it's really a shame to uh, have underestimated the need for training again for this basic model. Now let's move to a more challenging one. Uh, myocardial infarction in mice by ligation of the left descending coronary artery. Very challenging model. The surgery has to be performed after a thoracotomy in a beating heart of a mice. Um, it's really very small. You have to be extremely precise. Uh, again, you can definitely not train people without very, very uh, good basic skills. Uh, to, uh, they, they, they cannot learn the surgery, so people should start with a very, very good uh, surgery level. Uh, I won't go into deep details describe, describing the different steps of, of, of the program I wrote in blue. Um, I would say that the key messages beyond these slides are that um, here, as you can see, there are some very specific key gestures to be learned, like intubation, chest opening, coronary artery ligation, and chest suturing. And uh, unfortunately, those, these uh, technical gestures, they need a check on living animal. 
There are absolute, you can, you can initially train on cadavers, of course, but to be 100% sure that you are doing the gestures properly, you need to uh, let the animals recover and check that they are okay. Um, if you go through appropriate ex vivo steps, you can really reduce the number of, of animals. And in the program, I'm suggesting you're only using only, um, it's already quite a lot, but I think it's minimal, 25 surv survival surgery. The thing is that if you did something wrong, and it would happen during a training phase, with the intubation, again, the chest opening, the ligation, or the suturing, the animals uh, could be eventually uh, suffering. They could be in pain or they could even die. So the very one, one thing that is really uh, very important is to define relevant endpoints. Uh, you should really, while preparing your training program, identify what can go wrong with these key gestures and define uh, uh, endpoints that are adapted and uh, really prepare a very good follow-up program and make sure that if something went wrong, the animal will be humanly autonomized on time. Uh, again, a true story about something that happened. Um, surgeons with uh, a very, very good surgical experience had uh, a demand for the preparation of 200 animals for a study. Uh, they went through a quite short training program and saw that it was enough, so they started their experiment, again, with their 200 animals. But unfortunately, they went, uh, they, they had to go through a learning phase, and they lost uh, almost 80 animals going through this learning, uh, this learning phase, uh, again, because of the, of the very challenging key gestures I just mentioned. So, uh, actually, 80 animals is, is not that bad as compared to uh, uh, the number of requested key gestures mentioned in the program, but they had to explain to uh, their customers, because it was zero, that they again had to repeat the experiment because actually they more or less did their training while, while preparing uh, this batch for an experiment. So again, uh, I think that organizing and preparing good training program can really save a lot of animals and prevent people for uh, very bad events such as this one. Okay, um, is one good initial training enough? Well, not necessarily. Uh, if you have to do, uh, again, have to perform challenging models, but you don't have uh, the opportunity to perform them on a very regular basis, then you can lose uh, skills. Uh, it's well known that the half lifetime of uh, theoretical knowledge is, approximate, is of approximately 180 days. And after three years, um, globally, uh, all knowledge is gone. What about practical skills? Well, according to my experience, uh, depending on the difficulty of the model, uh, you really start to lose skills after three to six months, meaning that you may have to retrain after these time periods. Um, again, back to the example of Charles River surgery team, uh, we defined retraining programs, and depending on the, the model to be performed, we ask the surgeons to retrain. It could be a very fast, a, a very quick retraining, like in one or two animals, or in one or two cadavers, before they start again preparing the batch. Because what you don't want to do is to, uh, to perform surgeries following the blue curve you can see on the, on the um, shame. Um, the thing is that if you didn't perform a surgery for a while and you do it again and you have to go, to go through a learning phase again, then you will start your surgery in the morning and eventually you will spend one hour in your animal and then it's going to go better and better during the day and eventually at the end of the day it will take you 20 minutes to do the same surgery. It means that the batch of animals you will have prepared is highly anomogeneous and it this is really not something you want to do. You want to be as close as possible to the red line on the shame. So retraining is really a good way to avoid going through this blue line again. Uh, just for your, your information, there are general rules in this field. For example, in hospitals, uh, nurses that are uh, not 
practicing a specific technique for a while, like for more than one year, they have to train under the supervision of an experienced person before being allowed to do these gestures again on their own. Okay, so now that you've done your, your, your followed up, you followed up your nice training program and eventually you build up a nice retraining program, are you done? Well, not really. I think uh, you should also think about building a continuous training program. Why do I mean by that? Um, the idea is that uh, in surgery, uh, when you perform a surgery on a very regular basis, you never stop improving your technique. Usually you're nervous, you, 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 are, you are faster and faster with the, te with the technique, you are creating less and less trauma. And this is uh, something I really, really like with surgery. You never stop learning. You always do better when you practice a lot. And uh, the very best way to make sure that uh, these efforts and these improvements uh, are saved is to keep records. Because when you um, gain in speed, when you create less trauma, it's because you're doing something better. Uh, and usually it's very small things like placing your sutures slightly differently, handling your instruments slightly differently. And I think it's really very, very interesting to, for, for surgeons to keep records of what they are doing and also keep records of the outcomes. What is going on after the surgery? Okay, if I do that, if I slightly change that, what is going on afterwards? Is it, are, are the animals recovering faster? Is my surgery faster as well? So all these little things, uh, there are a lot of little details that make the difference in surgery and you should really keep records of them. Uh, the other interest of keeping records is to prevent technical drifts. Um, it happens, sometimes you, you, you really have the right gestures and then you change things uh, slightly and then you end up with problems and you don't understand why. Uh, recording all details of the way you're performing the surgery uh, and especially when it's uh, performed with success is the best way to prevent these technical drifts. Um, Post-operative follow-up, as, uh, as just mentioned, is, is really a key. Um, of course, you want to record what you are doing dur the, during the surgery, but also the outcomes. Uh, necropsies uh, is also something extremely useful. Sometimes you can perform uh, necropsies on, on uh, the animals you operated because they, they are actually involved in a study and you cannot see them anymore after the surgery. But if you have the opportunity or if you have few extra animals that are actually not involved in the experiment in which you can perform necropsies, it's also a very good way to check on what you did, uh, the level of uh, tissue damage you created, uh, and if um, your little step-by-step -step improvements are um, having results. Uh, so what are uh, the takeaway messages? Uh, first of all, do not train yourself and select your teacher carefully. Work with people who are really working according to state of the art, art technique because again, if you start working with um, uh, bad techniques, if you have bad habits, it will be very, very difficult to get rid of them. Learn from the past and as just mentioned, the best way to do that is to keep records of what you are doing, of what you are doing and of what the outcomes are. Once is not enough in many, many cases. Uh, the more you practice, the best you will get. And again, in surgery, you never, ever stop learning. Train, train, and retrain when needed. Uh, if you didn't perform a surgery for a few months, Think about retraining on few animals before preparing an animal for uh, an experiment. And uh, again, uh, because you have to practice so much, because you have to train and retrain, use in vitro techniques whenever possible to be compliant with the reduction principle. There are many, many things that could be done ex vivo. Uh, as a conclusion, I will first of all thank uh, the Laboratory Animal Science Board again, and especially Chepan Baran, who helped me to uh, build this presentation, as well as Professor René Rémy from the René Rémy Surgical 
uh, science center in the Netherlands who helped me a lot as well. Uh, I'm working uh, with René uh, quite often and he kindly reviewed this presentation and the surgery teams of Charles River I mentioned several times during the presentation. Um, please don't forget that survival alone is not enough. It's definitely not enough. What you want is to produce highly homogeneous batches for the experiments. That should really be your goal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Delphine, for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. In addition, I would like to let the audience members know that PDF versions of the slides from this presentation are available by clicking on the Files button, or you can log out of the presentation, log back in, and find it in our Resource Center if you would like to use any of the PDFs of the slides from this presentation. And we're going to wrap it up there. Again, I want to thank our audience members and Delphine Bouillard for her wonderful presentation and her participation in today's event. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August 2015. And you'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thank you very much. See you next time. Bye. Thank you, Brenda. Bye. Thank you.